Good afternoon and thank you for coming. After that introduction, I don't think I need to say anything. I could probably sit down. Uh, when I think of Johnny, um, Johnny Canvin, I often think of Star Trek and Captain Kirk looks at Mr. Spock and Mr. Spock looks at Captain Kirk and he says, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. I'd like you to think, or keep two things in mind this afternoon when I'm giving this little talk and it's a bit of a turbo version I see it's raining heavily outside now. So anyway, I like two, two, two little phrases to keep in mind. Uh, lost and found, hidden and discovered. And hopefully I have time to just develop that a little bit through a witness. Um, I work in the lost and found department, uh, like many of you. Perhaps you didn't know that. But this lost and found department is not like the lost and found department you find in the big department stores. Because usually they're buried away either on the top floor or behind some old dusty racks or down in the basement. No, this lost and found apartment is front and centre on the ground floor at the main door. It's God's lost and found apartment. And you're either one or the other or you're journeying there. And that's another idea I want to keep in mind this afternoon is journeying. We're lost and we're found. Somewhere we're along that path. Somewhere we've all been along that path lost and we were found and when we're found then we need to find the lost. I'll take you back a little bit in my life. Uh, I grew up in Wellington, one of eight children, the youngest, and uh, raised in a Catholic family, went to the Catholic schools, largely kept my faith intact but went a little bit off, rail, off the rails when I met a lot of good uh, Catholic men who were unfortunately heavy drinkers and uh, got a little bit uh, awry there with um, a life of partying and a good time and not worrying too much about the faith and things were pretty rosy. So, and a life of adventure. I'm really big into the outdoors as some of you may know, uh, tramping, climbing, canoeing, lately hunting. Um, but that life of adventure took me overseas and I want to take you to 1982 and I want to take you to the Amazon River. I was there uh, in a dugout canoe with my girlfriend, now my wife, Christine, and uh, we were floating down the Amazon with two uh, mad Americans and some of their local guides. These guys had come down from the Putumayo River in Colombia, and Christine and I had been journeying overland through South America for six months. We were doing it rough, and we had linked up with these guys who were, perhaps we could say, a little unsavoury, but hey, this is all about adventure, and these guys were looking for the lost tribe. No, seriously, they were looking for the lost tribe. I mean, there are some lost tribes out there. I thought I found the lost tribe in Mangere the other night, but no, it was just the Fijians and the Tongans in the local dress. <laughs> but we were seriously looking for the lost tribe. And um, however, my wife wasn't that keen on looking for the lost tribe, and she managed to talk me out of it. So I'm forever grateful to my wife for that because uh, we never saw those guys again and the last I remember of them was when we bailed out uh, at midnight on the Amazon, boarding a riverboat on the river, which is sort of like the sea, and we were about, I suppose, about a K offshore and it was pitch black and there was not a star in the sky and usually when you board a riverboat uh, at midnight on the Amazon River, you're a pirate and the riverboats, which are like buses that go up and down the Amazon, are, are arms. And they have large searchlights on to find the way. And we were boarding this thing, but we didn't know all that stuff. Hey, this is just about adventure. So um, anyway, we boarded the boat and fortunately got on safely and journeyed off into the wilds of Amazonia for another three months and on to Brazil. And we never saw these guys again. So we came home and then began uh, some years later an adventure travel business where we took people trekking to Nepal and then to uh, South America and um, Patagonia and different parts of the continent. That brings us up to um, 1991 when in the mountains with some good friends uh, we were tramping and they introduced us to Medjugorje. Uh, we had started to come back to our faith a little bit and they told us about the Blessed Mother who was appearing in Medjugorje. Well, we never doubted it from the moment we heard it. 
We knew that Our Lady was calling us. It was really not that we were seeking sensationalism, it was just the way that they put it across and the way that we could see that our lives were running. I was still with my girlfriend at that time, Christine. We did a lot of tramping together. And um, sorry, she was my wife at that stage. And we uh, just didn't doubt this message. But we wanted to go there. But we started promoting the message of, of um, Medjugorje for some years. And then a little bit later became involved um, in the Divine Mercy message when John Canavan first came to New Zealand and to Christchurch where I live and started promoting the message of Divine Mercy there. So we thought we were doing quite well. Remember this concept of lost and found. And, but we had this desire to go to Medjugorje. And uh, some years later, um, in um, 1995, uh, Our Lady answered that wish. And before we went, uh, we had this prayer that we'd learned from a friend to pray and ask our Blessed Mother to show us what she wanted to do with our lives. Christine and I had been married for some years at that stage, and um, we thought we were doing you know, good work in the church, which we were, but we just felt there was something missing. We really didn't know what that was. Lost and we were found. And so we went there, and we went this, with this, this um, sort of a, almost unspoken prayer, but we both had this prayer in our hearts. And it was affirmed as we went along the journey that um, this, this was what we were to ask for. So uh, not long after we'd been in Medjugorje, uh, my wife was in confession. So those of you who've been there know the confessionals all rode up there, and everybody's waiting, there's big crowds to go. And she went in, and her confession went a bit like this, and said, um, welcome to the Sacrament of uh, Reconciliation. Uh, where are you from? From New Zealand, Father. And uh, right, how, how long are you here for? A few days. And um, are you married? And uh, yes, I am, Father. Uh, how long have you been married? At that stage, I've, we had been married for nine years. Been married nine years, Father. Oh, right. And how many children do you have? There was a pause because the answer to that was zero. We didn't have any children. And Father said, oh, why is that? Is there some problem? Um, no, Father, it's just I can't bring myself to have children. Right. Are you practicing contraception? No, Father, we don't believe in contraception. My wife's a nurse. Oh, what are you, what, how have you avoided having children? Oh, we, we use NFP, natural family planning. Oh, but you have no children, so how can you space the children you don't have? So at this point, the priest said to my wife, well, what you're doing is not right. In fact, it's a serious sin. You can't use NFP not to have children. So my wife took that on board and came back out from the confessional. And um, a little bit further along the row of confessionals, I was in confession. And, and uh, but I forgot to say that I'd asked our Lord to tell us three times, three times, uh, what he wanted us to do with our lives and I'd also asked him to tell me this is my other unspoken prayer to tell me really clearly and plainly so that I couldn't mistake it exactly what he wanted us to do with our lives because I was a bit dumb and so I was in confession and my confession went like this oh welcome to the sacrament of reconciliation where are you from I'm from New Zealand oh right how long are you here a few days father Oh, right, and um, are you married? This was an open confession. And uh, are you married? Oh, yes, Father. Oh, right, how many children do you have? Um, I don't have any, Father. Oh, how long have you been married? Nine years. Oh, why, why don't you have children? Um, well, Father, we don't have them. My wife's not keen on having children, so we haven't had any. Oh, are you practicing contraception? No, Father. Uh, we're using NFP. Ah, you, you can't use NFP not to have children. That's a serious sin. And as he said that, he leaned forth in the confessional. He was an Italian priest, you know, they are very effusive. He took me by the collar like this. <laughs> and he tapped me on the face like that and he said, am I making myself absolutely clear to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so, never tempt God. So I came out of that uh, confession a little bit thunderstruck. And anyway, so my wife, we had to work through some issues and she went back to confession the third, a second time the next day and uh, wanted some further insight into this problem 
and her confession went like this, um, welcome to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, where are you from? I'm from New Zealand. Oh, how long are you here for? A few days. And um, are you married? Uh, yes, Father. How long have you been married? I've been married for nine years. Um, oh, how many children do you have? Oh, I don't have any, Father. And as it went on, the same confession, exactly, again, different. This was a different, totally different priest. So that was three times. We asked the Lord three times to tell us, he told us three times, in no uncertain terms. So after that confession, that third one, um, I remember it was a very beautiful evening and the, the church um, was lit up beautifully and people were singing and praying the church during adoration. And uh, we came out and I said to my wife, why don't we go for a walk up Mount Krizovac? So we did and we walked to the top and it was just a beautiful evening. And um, these, these were still in the days of the war, I might add, 1995. And um, so sometimes you could hear machine gun fire in the distance. But uh, then we came back down and as we're coming back down through the vineyard, which was behind the church in those days, I'm not sure if it's still there, um, some years since I've been to Medjugorje, um, we were thinking about this issue and because um, um, one of the priests had said to my wife, the last confession, said, when you go home to New Zealand, if you find there's still an issue um, with, with your uh, understanding or your acceptance of what the Lord has told you, <coughs> you need to go and see a Christian counsellor and get some additional help. And um, my wife's very matter-of-fact person, not really into that sort of touchy-feely stuff, so... She, she said, well, I, I'm not too sure about that. And I said, well, is this not Medjugorje? And she looked at me and said, well, well yes, what do you mean? And I said, does Our Lady appear here or not? Do we believe that she's truly in this place? That she graces people who come here looking for help? And we both answered yes to that. And I said, well, then, why don't you just ask God to heal you? So we went into uh, adoration, and there's this very beautiful singing, and our Lord was exposed there, and our, um, my wife, Christine, um, just asked our Lord to heal her. And as she did so, she feels intense heat right through her whole body and the tears, and she felt that this burden that she had carried all this time was lifted from her. So, thank you. So following that, we returned to New Zealand and... Um, some little while later, my wife became pregnant with our first child, and we returned the next year. We returned the next year to thank and praise God for his mercy to us. And we sought out Father Pavich, uh, who had been one of the confessors, to thank him, and to, uh, to just to offer this, this praise to, and thanks to God for this great blessing. And we had looked and far away places and different things and, and strange uh, works, if you like, all the time the message of what God wanted us to do with our lives was front and centre and we hadn't seen it. We were lost and, and had been found. So following on from that, that was uh, in 1997, our first child, Anna Marie, was born. She was born on the first Saturday, March the 1st, 1997. Her birthday is just next week. And uh, after her baptism, we consecrated her to Our Lady at the foot of Our Lady's statue. My mother told me that in times past this was a common practice and that I had been consecrated at the foot of Our Lady's statue when I was a baby. So we have done that with all of our children. Uh, three years later, uh, the Lord tested our faith further when he gave us our second child, uh, another daughter. Uh, her name is Dominique. Unfortunately, I haven't got her picture with you here today. It wouldn't load on the file, so I can't share that with you. Um, she was born with Down syndrome, and she will be 16 on March the 21st. Now, Lord always has a little bit of a snigger here, I'm sure, because some of you might know that March the 21st is International Down Syndrome Day. So, and she was born on that day. Uh, she's a treasure. She's very stubborn. She's very difficult. She's very naughty. Let's not uh, mix words here. Children with Down syndrome are very trying, as some of you know. They're very loving, but they're very trying. We've been through lots of teacher aids because she's homeschooled. We homeschool all our children. And we've had uh, eight teacher aids. My wife is the current teacher aid. 
Um, I think four of those teacher aides have left in tears down the road. Literally in tears down the road, yes, seriously. So I'm hoping my wife's not going to do that anytime soon. <laughs> so they, they are very testing but very loving. Um, prior to uh, having Dominique, um, <clears throat> my wife uh, conceived Dominique when she was 43. And uh, so there was lots of pressure, as you can understand. Um, you know, over the, over the age of 40, there's lots of pressure. And uh, my wife's a nurse, and um, truly, you don't mess with her. Especially on issues of health, she's a nurse. She worked for many years as a nurse, and then she worked in doctor's uh, practices as well, where she was able to witness to her faith and to her pro-life message also. And I remember her telling me that she saw the obstetrician one day, and the obstetrician told her or asked her or pushed her saying uh, you need to have, you're over 40, uh, there's a very high chance of having a child with Down syndrome or some other birth defect, you need to have an amniocentesis. And she looked him in the eye and she said, I'm not interested in your search and destroy missions. You need to be up front. There's an agenda out there to rid the world of children who have any defects. You need to be up front. You need to be on the case, you need to be in the face of the health professionals, otherwise they'll run all over you and push you where you don't want to go. So be informed, be up front. Don't let them push you around. And I re recall the words of Carol Waltia, Pope John Paul II, woe to you if you do not succeed in defending life. We need to defend life. Sometimes it's the lives of our own children. Do not let them push you around. And we had other uh, incidences of those types of things, but my wife, especially with her medical background, always stood up for them. We had no testing, we had no scans. We would take whatever the Lord sent us. All children are precious. However, my wife did know, the Holy Spirit, that this child would be different and would we can't say she knew she was going to have Down syndrome, but it was always in her mind through the entire pregnancy. I always pushed it away and said, no, no, don't be silly, it's just a normal baby. The one thing my wife feared in life was to have a child with Down syndrome. <laughs> and she had one. Sometimes the Lord sends you the very thing that you fear the most. But he also gives you the grace to cope with it. We were lost and had been found. So she was born um, as, uh, in, two, in the year 2000. She's a great delight to us and has grown into a lovely young woman who is very adventurous like her dad and her mum and loves to get out tramping with us and, I might add, and this might shock you, but she likes to go hunting with her dad. Yes, hunting, seriously. So I've shared many adventures with her and it's wonderful. Uh, three years later, our next child was born Bernadette. Some of you met her earlier this, this uh, week when she came up to help me at the Youth Congress. Bernadette, too, is a treasure. So we have three lovely young daughters and it's been um, my great privilege um, to be able to take two of those daughters, the eldest and the youngest. Our middle daughter, Dominique, uh, is not up to travelling big distances overseas, although she has travelled. Um, so I wouldn't be taking her overseas to congresses all around the world. My youngest daughter, Anna Marie, has been to three world congresses, starting when she was first 11 in Rome in 2008. Then she went to Krakow in Poland three years later, and then to Bogota in Colombia in 2014. Bernadette has been to uh, OACOM in Samoa and to John's Congress in Australia, as well as helping at our congresses in New Zealand, as has Anna Marie. It's been a great grace that I knew from the start that this work of mercy is not just for me. It can never be just for you. Your work of mercy must be for all people, and if those people are the nearest and dearest to you in your family, then include them, please. No matter how young they are, involve them. And I know that it's been a great grace for Anna Marie and helped her in her mission. It's very interesting to see where Anna Marie's headed now, and I know I have to finish shortly, that uh, on her birthday next week, she leaves home um, finally to, she's just 19, to go and become a youth counsellor and uh, chaplain to the parish in Tauranga 
for the rest of the year. Last year she did mission team in Christchurch, living with uh, five other young people in community and giving retreats in the schools. Uh, one of them is here today, down the back of the hall, Catherine. And I'm really pleased to see her here. And Kaylin, who's the current, um, they're both current members of the mission team. So I know that this work that we've put into her is bearing fruit. It's hidden and has been discovered. And so that's a great thing for her next Monday as she leaves. So please pray for her. Uh, as I finish, I'd like to share with you just a couple of things about our work, apart from the works that we've done with um, the Congresses. Because when uh, my wife's uh, mother died in 1997, the year of our first daughter's birth, uh, we were left with a small inheritance and we used some of that money to first put the Divine Mercy image on the cinema screen. And uh, it was very powerful in those, in those days to see our Lord on screen. When he used to come on screen right before the movie started, I'd been in the house when that came on and there was always a stunned silence. Just total silence. And then there's this voiceover, Jesus, I trust in you, and a free phone number for people to ring. Now our Lord's on television. He appears on television um, nationally at Christmas and Easter here, probably just for the Christmas and Easter Catholics. And he's there, and again we have that free phone number for people to ring to receive help of one form or another, uh, mercy from afar, uh, to help them on their spiritual journey. And I know that... Often the most powerful time is in the lead up to Divine Mercy Sunday when our Lord appears over Easter. And we often have lapsed Catholics ringing us up and saying, I was touched by the picture on TV, where can I get to Mass and Confession? It's just amazing because we know it's truly a miraculous image. Don't doubt the power of this image to convert people. God does converting, we just do the work to get him there in the places where people can see him. So it's hidden and discovered. Another work that we have been involved in, just to finish off, is writing to prisoners in foreign jails. Probably nearly 20 years ago when we first became involved with the Divine Mercy message and devotion and promoting that in New Zealand, we started receiving letters from Africa, and in particular from Zambia, from long-term prisoners on death row uh, who were writing for help. And I know some of you here today are involved in that work that we set up there and have also worked in with some other organisations overseas to uh, help these inmates in, in visiting the, the, the imprisoned by writing to them and providing assistance, uh, spiritual assistance. And as it's developed this work, we are now, through donors, able to uh, educate the children of some of these inmates in, in, their, in their jails because they're in jail for a long time and believe me you, you go to prison in Zambia for, for often for very little if robbery can give you life imprisonment in Zambia and probably are not a very fair trial. Their families never visit them, no one visits them, they can't, families don't have the bus fare, um, they're truly bereft and a letter from afar on occasion is a great spiritual sustenance to them and then to help their children not to get into the situation where they are because some of them are so desperate their wives have become prostitutes or have AIDS. So this is a great work of mercy. If anybody's interested in knowing more about that work of mercy, then please see me afterwards. And I'd just like to finish on this final note because remember we started about lost and found and I want to finish on this final point and it's hidden but must be discovered. If I can just take two minutes, two, three minutes of your time, I just want to just describe that to you. I've been reflecting on this since last year at the Congress in Bogota where I was to give a, a, a talk or a presentation one day and it never happened and I know that it didn't happen because our Lord wanted me to think about it more. And as I thought about it more, what came to me it was at the time that I was supposed to give a reflection was the sixth station. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. Vera icon. I want you to keep that image in your mind as you think about this and pray about this today. Um, hidden but must be discovered. Now we know that that station does not appear anywhere in the Bible. It's only in tradition. And I say that's hidden because it's a, it's a hidden work of mercy 
but we know that through, through tradition it has been discovered. And I want to present that to you because your works of mercy, whatever they might be, and especially if they're hidden works of mercy, they're hidden because God does not want us to become proud about them. He wants us to remain humble. But although they're hidden, like Veronica, they must be discovered. These works of mercy that we do are eternal. Pope John Paul II, St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Faustina, St. Catherine Siena, all taught every work of mercy has an eternal value, is eternal. So this work of mercy that you're involved in, that you're contemplating now, you're praying about now, is hidden. But it must be discovered so that those who discover your work will give glory to our Father in heaven. So I want to leave that, that thought with you as you pray and discern your work of mercy and how it is hidden now but must be discovered. Thank you and God bless you.